Okay, we're going to talk about the urinary system, finally. Okay, the learning objectives I've identified for this are review the anatomy and physiology of the urinary system, discuss tubes, contrast considerations for imaging the urinary system. We're going to talk about the occurrence, signs, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of the following. Renal agenesis, fusion anomalies, uh, position anomalies, calcifications, and hydronephrosis. So a lot of this is congenital stuff. Um, and then we'll discuss additive and subtractive radiographic techniques. So I do want to point out, I tried to be as detailed as possible on those objectives. When it comes time for studying for this exam, please closely pay attention to those objectives, right? I, I'm trying to be better about the objectives that I'm placing in the PowerPoint. So if you're ever wondering where the heck is the objectives for the exam, I've placed them in the PowerPoint, right? That's where they, that's where they live. Anything that's on these PowerPoints is the stuff that I've identified from the reading as important. And I try to be very careful in developing these PowerPoints to very specifically detail what you need to know. If it's on a PowerPoint, what I'm saying is it's important, right? I'm not just making a bunch of fluff and putting, a, putting together a PowerPoint. I'm whittling this stuff down to the bare bones, what's going to get you past the registry and help you be a successful technologist. So as, I've, as I pointed out before in talking about the peritoneum, the kidneys lie retroperitoneal behind the peritoneum. They consist of two kidneys, two ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. They function to form urine and excrete waste from the bloodstream. So I'll say it again, the kidneys are retroperitoneal. They are roughly at the level of T12L3, right? Um, the, uh, which one? The, the left one is slightly higher than the right. It always takes me a minute on that one. I'm sorry about that. Um, they consist of a hilum, which is where the renal artery enters, and the vein, and the lymphatics, and nerve plexuses. So there are common areas for combinations of a bunch of stuff come through that renal um, hilum. Lymphatics, arteries, veins, and then nerves. The nephron is the functional order, um, uh, unit of the kidney you, it, designed to filter stuff out. And then we got these major and minor calyces, which is a lot of times where we're imaging for contrast. And contrast is kind of the name of the game when it comes to viewing the kidneys. Um, I can't see them very clearly without contrast. Um, but we also might be running all sorts of tubes to them. The most common one is nephrostomy tube, which means that it's something that connects the renal pelvis to the outside of the body. So they stuck the person in the back, create an artificial access point to the kidney. And you can see that on this image on the top, the CT image. They've got a nephrostomy tube coming into the kidney. Oftentimes, we also see stents running out of the kidneys down the ureters, and these are placed uh, sometimes surgically, but oftentimes via a cystoscopy, which means they've run a, a catheter up the urethra through the bladder, up the ureter to the kidney to place the stent, right? The stent coils up, and the reason they do that is the, the ureter has become damaged or diseased, and they can maintain the patency or the flow of urine through the catheter, almost like a drink straw. Um, it is, they are generally radiographically visible. They're made out of plastic and radiographically visible. Um, the contrast studies that we do to visualize the kidneys include uh, CT, CT ur uroscopy or CT urograms, um, IVUs or IVPs, which are just basically the same thing. It means intravenous urogram or intravenous pilogram. Pilogram is just the older term for it. Um, retrograde pilogram which means we're running things backwards up through the ureter to visualize the kidneys, or renal angiography. We might actually just need to evaluate the arteri arterial flow to the kidneys, and that can be done in CT or through interventional. And uh, I included that last slide just so you could see the contrast uh, draining out of the kidneys into the major calyces. Renal agenesis means the absence of one kidney. Remember I said A means something's gone. So in this kind, A, A genesis means it failed to originate. Genesis, like the first book of the Bible. Nothing got created in this book, right? A genesis. 
The kidney did not happen, and so we will see enlargement of the other one, which is a lot of times called compensatory hypertrophy. The other kidney got bigger to compensate for the lack of its friend. Um, the incidence of this is relatively rare, but one in a thousand is not that rare. Um, if it is called Potter syndrome in the instance that there's an absence of both kidneys, this is incompatible with life. That means the child will die within a matter of days. Um, supernumerary kidneys is the opposite of this. It means the person has three kidneys, so they're borderline extraterrestrial at this point. Um, it is often asymptomatic unless it becomes infected. Um, so I've got uh, the illustration here of uh, renal agenesis is this patient appears to have a left kidney but not a right kidney. Okay, continuing on with congenital and hereditary diseases, hypoplasia means the kidney is less developed, right? So this is associated with an opposite side, hyperplasia, right? Um, uh, and it can be associated with hypertension as well. So if, you're, if we're understanding how the kidneys work, they're working to filter out stuff from the blood. So if I have a kidney that is too small, I just increased the blood pressure, right? I just increased the blood pressure, so we would call that hypertension. Hyperplasia, on the other hand, is overdeveloped kidney. So this is often associated with the opposite side of hypoplasia. So if one of the kidneys is too small, the other one's generally bigger. That's what that's saying. Okay, fusion anomalies. Horseshoe kidney, uh, fusion of the lower poles. So it, we're gonna have roughly a horseshoe, uh, horseshoe shape to the kidney, right? That is this image on our left. Uh, it's difficult to maybe see on this picture, but the lower, the south poles of the kidneys are connected across the midline, right? Um, this is the most common fusion anomaly is horseshoe kidney. The occurrence is still pretty rare, 0.25% of the population, men twice as often as women. If the kidney went ahead and moved on over to the other side of the body, we call that a crossed ectopy. It means the kidney's on the opposite of the midline, right? And they're fused. So opposite of the midline plus fusion, crossed ectopy. And it's the second most common fusion anomaly. Typically has to be treated with some kind of drainage and possible surgery. Horseshoe kidney, they just kind of let them keep on doing whatever they're doing. Just tell them to drink less Dr. Pepper, which we should all do anyways. Position anomalies of the kidneys. Malrotation, there it is again, but we're talking about malrotation of the kidneys. So we know that the kidneys lie at a slight angulation to the plane of the rest of the abdomen. If they are rotated or not in the correct position where we would normally expect them, that can cause problems. So it can be incomplete or excessive rotation. Um, ectopic kidney means it ain't where it normally should be, right? Ectopic is, is out of normal position. This is a fairly common one, right? Ectopic kidney occurrence in 1 in 800 of urologic exams, usually asymptomatic. Um, if it gets down into the area of the pelvis, we can call that nephroptosis, which means kidney in the pelvis, right? So it just migrated south enough now to where it's in the pelvis. That sounds painful to me. I don't know. I wouldn't want a kid. I got enough stuff going on in my pelvis already without adding a kidney in there. Um, we call that kidney prolapse or pelvic kidney. That would might require surgical intervention. So the X-ray image here I have is an ectopic kidney. It is a, just about to become a pelvic kidney. Urinary system calcifications, I did not do the predictable thing and include a CT image on this because they're just too darn easy to see on a CT image. I figured let's throw another ultrasound up there and look at, let them do what they do. Sometimes it's called urinary calculi, renal calculi. Um, it's second only to gallbladder calculi in terms of incidence. Uh, and is most often in the calyces or the renal pelvis. If it's a staghorn calculus, it's kind of throughout the entire uh, calyces. Um, diagnosis is often a stone study CT, which is just thinner slices, higher dose to the patient, or sonography. It shows up very clearly on sonography, so you can see this right here is the, uh, the kidney, the wall of the kidney, and then this shadow here is indicating where the stone is at. That shows up pretty clear to me. 
Um, no, no, I, no ionizing uh, I radiation. Um, obstructions, if they're going to happen, they're going to happen at the UV junction, right? So where the ureters um, are moving, kind of narrowing down, right? The narrowing down between the calyces and the ureter. Um, and we call that renal colic. Generally, it's treated with uh, lithotripsy, so they shake the patient up real hard with a shockwave type stuff, and it breaks up the stone. There's some other stuff that might, so hydronephrosis means that there's water in the kidney. That's literally what it means, but I think that just sounds better than uronephrosis because what it really is is there's extra pee pee in the kidney, right? Which doesn't sound good to me. Hydro just sounds nice. It sounds nicer than the opposite. than saying like you have too much pee pee in your kidneys, right? Don't tell people that. Don't tell people I ever said that. I'm not going to post this to YouTube because of that, but um, no, uh, this is going to, it can progress to ischemia and parenchymal atrophy and eventually loss of renal function. Um, oftentimes this, if we don't see a stone, we might at least see the hydronephrosis. So if the kidney stone is stuck there at the UV junction, it's causing backflow of urine into the kidney. You're basically going to blow the kidney out, right? Um, so that's what we're seeing over here. This is normal draining system here on this uh, patient's uh, left side. Yeah. And on the patient's right, we have hydronephrosis backflow, and it's like blowing out now the draining system. Eventually, if it gets bad enough, it can actually blow, blow out the renal capsule, right? So that's a problem. Diagnosed with uh, sonography, spiral CT is going to give you a little bit more sensitivity for that, though. Uh, and finally, the uh, various additive subtractive stuff you can see within the urinary system, nothing's easy. Um, but the ones that I want us to focus on are, you know what, don't worry about any of that stuff. It's just there if you're interested.